uh, Karen, if you wanted to record um, on the recommendation of uh, Dr. Rebecca Stewart. Um, but we'd like to spend a little bit of time with you this morning. Um, again, my name's Andrew Cedar, and my leadership co-host today um, will be Karen, uh, or will be Kay Monk Morgan. And uh, Karen will be um, our tech crew uh, for today. And, and we're just gonna help facilitate you through kind of a leadership journey. Um, and we, of course, we all wish you well um, and that you're doing well. And we really had hoped that we could have met in, in Minnesota uh, in the month of May for your board meeting um, where we can engage together, uh, be together, um, share those formal stories as well as those informal stories uh, in regards to how things are going uh, for you. And, and um, being in Minnesota would be really a, a proud to have host um, the board of directors, the EOA leadership team and board of directors, uh, the Eli uh, to be in Minnesota. But, you know, as, as all of us were in this new uh, new way of doing business, uh, I guess. And um, so Dr. Rebecca Stewart um, had asked previous EOA presidents to, and leaders um, to join with you throughout the year um, to share a little bit, engage with you a little bit on, on how you're doing and um, share some, some information. So we're just gonna introduce, I'll introduce myself a little bit more detail. Um, again, my name is Andrew Cedar. And um, I'm in the state of Minnesota, that's where I work, uh, but I live in Wisconsin. So people always go, are you Wisconsin, Minnesota? And um, I, I guess it just depends on, on who you're talking to and who I'm talking to. I, I kind of had those uh, dual allegiance. Um, I've been in, in MAP slash EOA um, since 1988. Um, and I served on a variety of different committees, both in the chapter levels, as well as the regional level. I was a regional president or a, a state president, a chapter president of, of Wisconsin in the early 2000s. Um, I was a, ch a chapter president in Minnesota. Um, I think my ultimate goal was to be a president in each of the chapters um in in my career in my lifetime uh but then i thought oh, okay that's way too high hard and i do not want to live in ohio ever um <clears throat> nothing personal adam um but um what i think um uh my other my i think my my default plan was well maybe i should just be the president of of eoa um instead so then i was um uh the president of eoa um, you know, and, and served honorably in, in that, um, in that role, um, at the regional and, and national level as well. So that's kind of been my experience with, um, you know, with MAP and, and EOA, um, you know, kind of through the years. Um, Kate, you want to talk a little bit about, introduce yourself and, uh, talk a little bit about, you know, your, your journey. Absolutely. Good morning. Uh, and I, like uh, Andrew, I'm excited to be with you all here um, in this format. Was really looking forward to engaging you in person as well. Um, it's been a while since I've had an opportunity to really engage uh, EOA and my peeps. And so uh, having an opportunity to be back in a space with uh, folks that I consider home uh, was really um, top of chart for me this year was one of the, the things that I actually put on my um, my vision board this year. And so um, I'm going to take this, but I'm, I'm looking forward to an opportunity to, to see you all publicly or face to face or in person, I guess, is, is the language we're using. Um, like Andrew, I've served in lots of different capacities um, for uh, what was known as, as MAOP and now EOA. Um, having served, there's probably not a committee that I haven't either served on or chaired. Uh, I've had the opportunity to lead two amazing emerging leaders groups, uh, the Perfect 10 uh, and the Elite 08. Those are my peeps still. Um, so love, love, love having had that particular experience. Um, 
during my leadership as the EOA president, we actually became EOA. Uh, we, we went through, uh, I had the opportunity to work with a group of, of folks to create what I think was a, a launch pad for the future of Maya by um, indoctrinating and trademarking both our name and our uh, logo, creating the Women in STEM conference and the Men of Excellence conference, and really um, working with some some awesomely dedicated individuals uh, in a way that we hope would solidify leadership um, that now you all are stepping into and, and um, moving forward. And so excited about that. Um, I recently finished a six year uh, stint serving on the, the national board. Uh, I had the opportunity to serve with Andrew uh, and that was yet another gift. Uh, I finished my term as the COE board chair uh, in 2017. Uh, and so I've been kind of on vacation a little bit for about a year and ready to re-engage and that energies will, those energies will be uh, refocused into to the chapter and the, um, uh, our regional association. Uh, unlike Andrew, I don't have the pleasure of continuing direct service to my TRIO program. I served as a director of a TRIO program for 20 years here at Wichita State University in Wichita, Kansas. Uh, and right now I serve as the assistant vice president for academic affairs uh, at, at the same institution. And so um, I get a chance to certainly work with our TRIO colleagues and continue to be very engaged and involved uh, in first gen work, uh, but doing it from a different, um, a different station at this point. Great, Yay. thank you. Yay. Um, what we would like to do in the next, um, <clears throat> you know, 40 minutes or, is to really help you as a board, as the EOA board and, and individually as leaders um, to just kind of reflect and think would you know we're going to spend a lot of time um tugging at your heart and tugging at your brain um in regards to um what has this leadership journey meant um to you and is meaning to you um as, as you're going through this so for the next you know couple of minutes here um just kind of breathe for a second um, and just think and reflect uh, in the past three to four years as you as a leader within your chapter and within the association. Um, reflect a little bit less on your position as a trio leader, although we know that's a part of your, um, part of who you are and part of your nature at your institution. Um, but really think about this journey, this part of your journey in regards to your, um, your experiences and your leadership as being part of this board, um, being in your chapter and, and being part of this EOA board. Um, try to just spend a little bit of time just thinking about things that were important to you overall. Um, try not to have one event or one activity, whether positive or negative, be your what what drives you here and, and getting you into the right frame of mind. Um, but really think about your chapter, your region, your nation uh, in regards to what you've done in the past, especially in the past three or four years. So just kind of think through that a little bit.
go ahead, Kay, if you want to have them think a little bit more about the next part. Yeah, um, again, I think Andrew stated it as as he kind of framed our work this morning is that we, we really want to spend some time being intentional uh, on reflection and thinking about um, who we are as leaders and, and how we engage others. So I, I'd like you to, to pause it and, and think in the same kind of space, what, what leadership traits, um, three leadership traits that you think have been um, elevated, amplified as a result of your, your leadership, either at the chapter level and or at the, the EOA service level. Just three things. And if you've, you've got those three things, um, for those of you whose eyes we can see, we'd ask you to, to just let us know that you're ready. So when, when you think about um, the three things that, that you listed, three or four leadership traits that, that you've really had an opportunity to develop, um, what comes to mind? What's made you stronger as a leader? Um, what are some experiences that have been really meaningful as you, you move forward? Um, any, I, I, let's get two or three voices um, to elevate. So if, if you've got an idea of something that you listed on your um, sheet, just, I guess you, you probably ought to raise your hand given this particular format and I think I can see everybody's screen. Um, who wants to share one thing that one leadership trait that was elevated for you? Yes, Ms. Torres. So um, I was kind of uh, brainstorming and, and writing out some ideas here, but I do believe my values have been tapped this year and it's, it's meant a lot to, for me to work alongside some, uh, some individuals and in particular, I will speak to Adam. Um, in, um, you know, recognizing that I value transparency and um, big ideas, you know, and I think for, for um, in my experience, sometimes it can be, um, it can be, uh, there can be a certain level of resistance to those big ideas, um, it, but being able to work collaboratively together um, to be able to have someone to bounce ideas off of has been really um, helpful for me as I try to contextualize um, the, our transition into a new year as we um, have confronted this time collect, you know, together. Um, and so I, I really do want to say that the, the, the ability to share those big ideas, to work um, in conjunction with somebody, and know that we, we both have that transparent um, um, level of communication and we both bring the best of intentions to the table makes that process so much easier and very relieving, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for elevating that. That's awesome. Thank you. Lolita. Had to unmute myself. <laughs> um, I can speak along the same uh, same lines, but um, I think I'm going to focus more on like the networking and I'm making up words here, cross compatibility, um, mm -hmm. because what I do in TRIO, whether it's Illinois TRIO, EOA, COE, you know, all of the involvement that I have in the TRIO world. I also cross-reference that back to other organizations that I'm in leadership of. So things that work for um, me and TRIO, I bring some of those ideas into uh, my sorority organization, uh, my alumni association with the institution where I hold higher offices, you know, at. And I think that when, um, you know, we're working 
with a, a bunch of people with different ideas. Um, they might have different um, thought processes and uh, emotions and feelings towards, you know, certain things. It's important for us to, one, be transparent, as Zanya said. And then also I wrote down like inclusiveness and team working. Of course, um, we know most during this uncertain time of pandemic that we had to like shift and like just redo everything. You know, we had, you know, face-to-face in-person things that were, you know, supposed to take place. And we all had to pretty much shift to this online format and Zoom. And I'm sure we've all been on our fair share of Zoom uh, calls and Google Meets and Hangouts and all of that, trying to get, um, with our students and with other um, employees. And so I think I just find it, um, you know, when I'm reflecting on my leadership, my networking has enhanced. I've always been like a, a, a natural leader in everything that, you know, I participate in. And that's because, and I feel like, especially in TRIO, being a TRIO alumni, um, I knew what I expected out of my um, staff that worked with me when I was in high school and college and as a TRIO student. And so then I reflect back to those days when I was in high school and college, what did my TRIO um, you know, advisors and staff do for me that I liked, what they did that I didn't like. And then I use those things to do that cross compatibility now as I'm a trio leader and reaching back to students. I want them to be able to experience that same thing. So then when they um, enhance and if they become trio uh, professionals, they will do the same thing that I did. Awesome, thank you so much for that. Um, both your that testimony, if you will, uh, and your, your example, Adam. I think for me, um, one of the biggest things over the last several years for me has been the development and maybe recognition of self-confidence. Um, I think people have a certain level, expect a certain level of confidence in their leaders, right? Because that's what gives them confidence in their leadership. And I think for me, you know, I'd be lying if I didn't say that even to this day, I sometimes have imposter syndrome walking into a staff meeting with my own team, right? <clears throat> and so I think, you know, it, it's kind of like been a chicken and the egg situation where the way that you develop that self-confidence is to stick yourself out there in those leadership roles because that's what gets you comfortable in those roles. But at the same time, you know, you're, you're hesitant to do that because you don't have that self-confidence all the time. And so I think for me, you know, working my way through a different committee or, you know, a, an officer role in my chapter and then going through Eli and being able to network, as Alita said, um, with colleagues um, at the regional level and then starting to serve on various committees to now chairing a committee at the regional level um, and having close friends and colleagues that you can, like Zanya said, bounce ideas off of and, and talk through some things, I think helps give you, gives me confidence. Um, so I think just over the last several years, you know, being comfortable with my leadership and knowing that it is enough um, so that I have that self-confidence so that when it's time to stand in front of a room of people or make a decision, I know that, you know, I, I'm, I'm able to do that confidently and that it will be um, accepted and viewed in a positive way. Great, thank you. We'll take one more. Angie, I see your hand. You're muted, hon. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think for me, uh, a big one would be uh, communication. Um, I felt like I've always been a fairly good communicator, but um, within the last year, well, definitely the last year, um, with all of the COVID happening, um, just really having to communicate with so many different people in a short amount of time to try to accomplish a lot of things, um, planning and then unplanning and then replanning and then unplanning again to replan. I think that that's been really difficult and, and um, really takes a heightened sense of communication to be able to accomplish that, to make sure that there's a large number of people <clears throat> on the same page or even a small number of people on the same page to get out a, uh, a message to a large group of people, make sure that it's accurate. Um, 
And then, of course, along with the communication, that listening piece that goes along with that on, um, you know, we've had a lot of obstacles this year, um, but, you know, taking the input of, of everyone, not just myself, but just being a good listener and trying to then figure out the best way to navigate and communicate what is the best way to move forward. And knowing that I don't have to make decisions alone. So that's always a nice thing, too, that I have other people that I can communicate with to, to make the best decisions. Yeah. I, I think those are all really powerful um, things that you brought to the table. And one of the things that we often talk about leadership development or, or leadership opportunities um, about the things that we learn in the midst, but never really what we came here for, right? So the recognition that you had a skill set when you were elected to serve in these roles. Um, those skill sets are now being explicated and revealed in brand new ways. Um, one of the tasks that um, Madam President, who's just joined us, gave both Andrew and I as a part of this experience is to share a little bit about our individual journeys of leadership and, and help um, create some, some opportunities for, for further dialogue. Um, I have an example that required each one of those uh, pieces to be exercised in a, in a brand new way. Um, and, and I referenced it earlier, is when the decision was made to change the name of our uh, illustrious association from MAOP to EOA. And you can imagine that that might have been uh, a really interesting set of discussions around why that needed to be done. Um, getting outside, even the, the tagline of, um, you know, a Midwest region that set us aside. We were one of the, the first regions that, that um, mitigated the geographic location of our association and started to do national events. Our Girls in STEM conference was a national event. It was a t created to serve the entire nation. Uh, our Men of Excellence was the same way. Um, and those decisions, those were big, bold ideas because we'd done student leadership conferences for a really long time. We'd never done something with the intention of aligning with a national movement. And both of those ideas, our Girls in STEM and our Men of Excellence, uh, Men of Excellence was, was um, modeled after President Ob then President Obama's um, My Brother's Keeper movement. And so just the, the audacity to have a bold vision to move our association forward in a new and bold way um, took having bold ideas. It required me to have a, a person or persons. At the time, Roxanne Gregg uh, was a, a strong colleague, continues to be one of my best friends ever, um, to go to and say, OK, this is going to be crazy. And there are going to be a lot of people excited about it and people who aren't going to be excited about it before I stand up in front of these people with this much confidence as a, as a person who'd been in the movement for, you know, 15 years. And I felt like I was grounded. I was getting ready to go walk in front of Tendaji Ganges and Delta Coven and, and Gandhi Kamatuka and lots of names from your particular regions who have a long and storied history with our association and say that it was time to make a seismic shift. Um, and so having to, to grow confidence in order to be able to say, I've done the research, I've talked with the marketers, I believe in my heart of hearts that this is the best way to move us forward at this particular time. And then to be able to stick with that meant I needed to then go create a network of people who believe similarly uh, and a network of people who didn't believe what I believe to really listen and to hear, you know, what the feedback was, what the concerns were, what the fears were, and to try to, to the degree that I could, to move people along a continuum of acceptance and to acknowledge and um, support the loss that was happening with folks. And so that those are the areas that you've elevated, that you came to the table with, I just want to amplify the, the level of importance that they have, not in their singularity, but in putting all those things together and how one particular um, activity, incident, circumstance, situation can elevate all of those things for you in your leadership journey. 
Awesome. Andrew? Yeah, very good. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> next, we'd like you to spend a, a minute or so thinking about, especially using the context of the past three to four years, um, not just the past three to four months, but the last three to four years collectively, about some areas of concerns or areas of weaknesses or vulnerabilities that you've experienced. Um, and to think about some of those, and again, sometimes those things might be, um, you didn't realize that those were weaknesses that you had or, or areas of concerns or vulnerabilities or challenges that you've occurred. Um, they may be things that, um, you know, you found yourself in those kind of situations. Um, whoops, sorry about that. Um, you found yourself in, in certain situations. So just spend a minute or so just thinking about some of the vulnerabilities and areas and challenges that you've experienced, especially in the last three to four years. Okay, Lolita, would you like to share um, something? Yeah, um, I think um, I think back, um, and I'll even go back. And um, Andrew, you can kind of attest to this with you know my Eli um, process. Um, that was <laughs> a very different experience uh, for me, um, as when I was going through the process, um, didn't really have the support of the chapter and so um you know having to pay out of pocket for you know things during a time that i really couldn't afford to pay for my own flight or pay for my own travel or whatever have you and had to either miss um you know important um eli events or training or um you know having to go to the eoa board to you know, ask, you know, for assistance um, for reimbursement or whatnot, because I had to use, you know, other funds to, to get to a conference. And I think um, during that time, it demotivated me and my conf confidence to Illinois Trio. And everybody, you know, that knew me knew, you know, I'm like all about Trio because like if it wasn't for trio i wouldn't be nowhere anywhere near you know where i am now with um, education or even career wise and so i think that pushed me to make sure that other people that come after me in the eli process didn't have to go through the situation and the hardships that i had to go through because that really tainted my experience um with that process and so um, I think now uh, as an Illinois Trio board member, you know, we now create a budget line item, you know, for our Eli. We make sure that our Eli give reporting um, at the board meeting, you know, they're part of the board, you know, and it, and it makes um, that position feel a valuable. Um, and so then you're, you know, not just, oh, I'm going through this process, what am I going through this for? You know, I'm not even really, you know, learning anything because I can't attend, you know, the things. And so I think sure. that um, experience, even though it was a negative experience and caused some weaknesses within myself, it ultimately enhanced, you know, my leadership when I became an actual board member um, and trying to make sure that 
people's experiences. Shanna, yeah. I think for me, um, I, one of the things that I lack and I still do um, is a lot of vision. I'm, I'm pretty, I, I can get things done. I can, you know, I'm, I am effective at, at doing things, but I watched leaders over many years and they all have these ideas and visions and thoughts about where something should be going and direction. And I was like, well, I can, I can sustain, I can maintain, I can make sure, you know, we don't fall off a cliff and then COVID came along and we're kind of falling off cliff, but um, I'm, I'm doing my best to mitigate that. Um, but I, I still don't, I'm not a big visionary person in watching, you know, when, when people get installed and then they make speeches and then they have chapter conferences and they make speeches and I'm like, I don't have that. I'm still not sure next year when I'm president, what I will say, um, you know, and I think that's an important part of leadership is in, in inspiring people to follow you or in some way getting people to follow you. And that's, I'm, I'm still not there. I have no idea in, in regard to that, what, um, how to make that happen. Okay. Others that want to share? Um, I'll go ahead. I was thinking about, um, I remember looking at the EOA board at the first um, time I went to a conference and just thinking like, there's no way I could be part of that. Um, all those people doing those things up there was a little intimidating. <clears throat> um, been part of other boards that were much smaller before. Um, and so then still sometimes just thinking, how am I up here? Or kind of like what Adam said, that imposter syndrome, like why, what's, why am I here? But then um, um, also just um, doing, um, I guess, yeah, I guess that's about it. Anybody else? I'll go ahead. Yeah, has her hand up. Yeah. Um, so, in 2016, January of 2016, I moved up from Florida where um, I was a trio director over an EOC program. And that same year I ended up um, at our EOA conference. Um, and I had the opportunity to um, see you, K. Monk Morgan, um, kind of address the audience. And I was, I was in awe um of the region at that time coming from a different region and knowing um kind of like the outside perspective and how um nationally eoa was viewed so i can say i can say that there was that initial like interest in wanting to be involved but that certain level of intimidation right um getting more involved uh, at a state level, I will say that um, I, I am one, a selective extrovert, right? And um, that's a real challenge that I struggle with um, when we talk about networking. And um, I, I find that in combination with me feeling sometimes um, or, or more so earlier on, um, that I was an outsider to the state. I was brand new. Um, I wanted to be involved, but I still hadn't plugged in or created a support around, um, around me. Um, my institution, for example, a lot of individuals at my institution aren't really, are not really plugged in, um, and involved at the state level. And so I felt, um, very much so like um, a foreigner or an outsider. Um, and every now and again, I will say I, I kind of have those same elements and those same feelings that come up. Um, this year, and I'll, I'll say even last year, um, was more so, and I, I viewed it as an opportunity to kind of right a wrong as well, because I, um, 
uh, the year prior to that, so 2017, 18, um, I served with Scott in, um, as part of Eli. And um, I think that year was very challenging for me personally and professionally. And I dealt with a lot of, you know, large personal and, and financial struggles. Um, and I did not have the experience that I ha had hoped for. And so um, that meant being, you know, not present at certain events. And I saw that as a failure on my part to deliver on the commitment that I had made. And so um, I took the year after that to really, um, how I, I saw it as an opportunity to, um, to find a way to serve and was able to uh, serve as Ohio Trio Secretary. And now in this role as president elect, um, but I was really afraid that, um, not just being that outsider, but people not knowing me, people not seeing um, my level of interest in helping um, to bring people together and you know, reinvigorate a certain level of enthusiasm amongst my colleagues to get more involved at the state level, um, I, that people would see that as just talk. Mm -hmm. And I think as we move into a new year, um, I also try to, you know, keep that perspective and that's a big fear of mine. I don't want people to see, you know, my, my level of engagement or um, a particular, you know, um, vision for the future is just talk. Right. And, and appreciate you all sharing, um, you know, especially vulnerabilities and experiences that you've had. Sometimes those experiences, um, negative experiences or frustration experiences is what drives us um, to do more, be more, um, and, and to show that, um, you know, leadership. And, and sometimes we get, we get in our own way. Um, sometimes when we think, well, these people, you know, there's certain individuals that can do this so much better than I can, so I'm not going to do it. Um, and I think one thing I've learned through this process um, is really that there isn't not a one size fit all. Um, and that all leadership traits, vulnerabilities, um, strengths, challenges, um, all have a purpose and all have, all have a seat, all should have a seat at the table as well. I think for me personally, the vulnerabilities that I really had learned or had really found out about myself um, was to me, the word accountability. Um, I don't like, to me personally, my feeling is my job is not to keep people accountable. Um, and um, my job really as a leader was to make sure that people have all the tools for them to be accountable themselves. So I know that frustrated the, it frustrates the crap out of people um, as a leader when, um, when people are going, well, why aren't you holding that person accountable? Why aren't, you know, why do you let them get away with? whatever that might be. Um, and I've learned over the, over the years is that people like accountability. People want to be held accountable. Um, people want to hold, hold other people accountable. And I needed to kind of learn how to balance that out. I still don't, um, even my own kids, I don't keep them accountable. Um, I try to get them to understand what they need to do to keep themselves accountable. Um, and, and I, as a leader and as a parent, um, I've messed it up, um, you know, with, uh, you know, with my kids, um, you know, and, and that's something I'm, you know, we keep struggling, um, you know, as we, as we kind of go through, but, but the experience, uh, my leadership experience with, with EOA, um, had shown a lot of things that I just didn't. I was in my own little world, and uh, and I think the experience had had really allowed me to understand a little bit more that there really isn't a one size fit all, um, and that everybody should uh, and belongs and should be valued as a seat at the table. 
um, as we kind of go through. Powerful. A couple more words, or maybe even a sentence. One thing that surprised, has surprised me on my leadership journey is. Yeah, Angie. Um, one thing that surprised me is um, just like how supportive people are, have been around me. Um, you know, I'm the type of person that likes to get things done, but not necessarily ask for help. Um, but this last year, um, I've kind of been forced to ask for help um, and encouraged to ask for help as well. And um, I've been really surprised by people uh, that they want to help, that they, they want to see things go well. They want to, you know, be helpful, I guess. So I just, I was really surprised with that. So pleasantly surprised. Awesome. Adam, what surprises me is um, that what I'm experiencing, other leaders are also experiencing, and that mm. it's okay as a leader to not be okay all the time. Ashe, right? Because that that's good. Scott, do you are you do you want to add to that? Um, I was kind of. Yeah, add to that and add to the other things that um, um, you can, um, if you let, people will do things if you let them and people want to do the things. And so that, you know, being a leader of Iowa Trio is a big responsibility, but the burden is lessened by the rest of the membership um, willing and wanting to step up and do other things, which in turn creates new leaders within the organization as well. Other things that have surprised you, either about your, your abilities, capabilities, how people engage with you when you are in these formal leadership roles, particularly as you have grown as a leader? I will say, well, Oh, I'm sorry, Kay. I just started talking. Yeah, go ahead, Dr. Stewart. <laughs> oh, sorry. You're looking, are you are we using the raise hand function? Sometimes I'm just looking at the screen to see who, who looks like they're ready to share. Go okay. Right ahead. If we are, I will follow suit because I was late. And thank you all for allowing me that time. Um, Indiana was having a good conference. Uh, so I, I would say what surprises me is that, um, you know, when we doubt ourselves, you know, Adam said something about the imposter syndrome. When we doubt ourselves and we think, oh man, these six people don't believe in me or don't or, or not or willing to get on board with whatever I'm, you know, pushing, whatever the vision is. But for those six, there's 16 or 60 who are. And and that has always surprised me, right? You sit here and say, Well, it's me, and kick your can down the street. But meanwhile, you still have supporters over here that say, Hey, I want to jump on that. I think this is a good idea. Let's try it. Um, so so that has been very good and uplifting as a leader. Awesome, thank you. Robert? Yeah, just one of the things I think I've really recognized a lot through different roles as I've gone through uh, leadership, especially within the state of Michigan, um, that you're gonna fail. And yet people are generally pretty forgiving. If you come to them and just, you know, take ownership and uh, lay it out there and say, you know, I'm, uh, I, I dropped the ball on that one, and uh, generally, I think people will um, will kind of be able to forgive that and, and move forward, and still, you know, give you the support you need. Great, DeAndre. Hello, everyone, and I'm sorry for being late. Had another meeting, um, but I would have to kind of piggyback on what a lot of people were saying that encouragement and support that you get um, when in the moment of failure. I know this has definitely been tough on all of us this year, and just trying to really think about what we can do with our students, but also with our uh, membership and making sure that they get the support and things that they need. So, as I, you know, for me, what surprised me. I'm beating myself up. I felt like I couldn't think fast enough to kind of put things in place for what we needed in relation to our students. But ideas that I brought to the membership and was like, you know, let's let's do this, let's do that. Everybody um, continued to encourage me and support me, and it was a big surprise, which was good because, of course, you know, it's a big it's a big 
uh, uh, duty to sit in one of these seats and you don't want to disappoint at all. And so uh, just the support and encouragement is real good. You know, I, I think it's powerful. Um, and and I, Andrew developed this particular set of exercises, but to start with, you know, what did you come with? Um, what are some areas that you're still working on? And then what, what surprises you? Um, you know, and you all have really heartfelt, I think, encouraging things. So I'm, I'm gonna give you an op the other side of the coin for a little bit, um, because leadership isn't always pretty, it's risky, it costs, uh, and there are times when you don't win. And, you know, I, I've had the opportunity to get my ass kicked in a couple of arenas uh, in a very public way within the, the TRIO community. Um, and that absolutely surprised me because of all the reasons that you all previously gave, that people are supportive, people tell you that, that they're on board. Um, and one of the, so one of the surprises in my leadership is that when people smiled and said, yes, I assumed that that meant that they were on board. And then when it came to a valid ballot vote, that was an indication of their support. When in actuality, I probably should have spent more time talking to folks individually and ensuring that those nods of support were really backed up with an intention. Um, because in, in leadership, I think it, it's really hard to sit with people. The TRIO community is so very different than, than the community that I'm living in professionally now in that we spend a lot of time together. I mean, they, I'm looking at, um, you guys have no idea how good it feels for me to look at this screen and see people that I served with on lots of different places at different times. And, went to dinner with and had drinks with and told jokes with and um, the number of hours we since spend sitting in different lobbies talking about any number of different things. That doesn't happen lots of places. And we assume because we have those really good relationships that when it comes down to business, that means I'm gonna have that support. Well, one of my surprises is that's not necessarily what it means, or at least in a couple of situations, that's not what it meant. Uh, and then having to go back and check what were my, where did, where did I miss the cue that we weren't in alignment on some things. And so um, I think what has an, a development that I had, particularly serving at the COE board level, is an acknowledgement that everybody who's your friend is ne not going to necessarily vote for you. There's a meme that's going around now that um, I think, Dr. Dr. Stewart, I saw you post. Um, you can have a black friend and still be racist, right? You can be my friend and have a drink with me and still vehemently disagree with my policy decision and vote me down. Um, and and that, was, that was a surprise for me because I thought if we good, you trust me, we're going to be okay, you're going to follow. We went to the mall together and everything is fine. And those things are not synonymous in leadership. And so balancing that personal relationship with the professional role um, was a surprise and has impacted the way I look at things moving forward in a whole lot of ways. Shanna? I just wanted to um, kind of comment on what you're talking about is, I guess I'm glad that in, in the trio world that we can still have those disagreements and be friendly and be friends and, and disagreements about um, when it comes down to a policy decision and we can we can vote in different ways about what we think is right or wrong without being disagreeable because it's so many aspects of our world that we live in right now we demonize the people with whom we disagree on policy and so I'm glad that we are part of an organization where we can still be friendly and we can disagree with people on policy and on votes and on how to move forward and still go out and have a drink with them and genuinely care about them as a person at the end of the day. Absolutely. And, and let me make sure that I'm, I'm not detracting from that. My point was the higher you ascend in leadership, the less likely people are to tell you that they disagree with you. And so as a leader, you go into a space thinking, I've spent all afternoon with these people who are my, my people. 
if I was way off base, someone would have said something. Some would have pulled my coattail. Someone would have said, let's have a drink. Um, I think you're on the wrong path here. Um, but the higher you ascend, the more in awe and, you know, the harder it gets for people to tell you the truth. So the more incumbent it has to be on the actual leader to make sure you're checking that the smile and the nod is, is genuine. It, does that make sense? So I, I completely concur that we can disagree. Um, I'm just encouraging you. The surprise for me was that I needed to do more work. Jonathan. In my world, it's been um, a little bit of both. A lot of people have been telling me um, things that I'm, I have missed, but there's also the other side where people have to recompensate. They, they don't believe that I belong where I belong. So they always have to tell me two or three times um, the task that needs to get done. Just like a reminder, uh, which makes me feel like that they don't think that I'm competent enough to be able to keep track of what's going on um, or, or that I am not capable of doing the task that, they're, that is in front of me. So it's kind of one of those things that you have to always ask as a person, as me, as a leader, I have to always keep in mind that there will be people that do not think that I belong there and that I need to work extra hard to prove that I do there. Uh, and there's also, also people that because they don't belong, that they don't think that I belong there, they think that they could do it better than me. But those people are typically not stepping up to those positions that I'm saying like, okay, so you want to tell me, you want me to be your puppet, but you don't want to jump in to be a leader. Um, so that to me is what, what has surprised me in, in many leadership roles that I have held. And that's the one common uh, thing that I come um, to conclude is that people that believe in you will help you. People that think because, that you got there because of your skin color or your gender or whatever, they're going to like, make you feel ignorant and, and dumb sometimes and do not have that confidence that you could lead them in ways. Powerful. Thank you for sharing that. Lolita, you have you want to add? Yeah, um, and just add into what Jonathan, you know, was saying, I can, you know, even think back to my institution. So <clears throat> I had always, you know, um, been in the student services area uh, from when I first was hired, my supervisor being the Dean of Student um, Services. And, you know, I always used to tell him because he was like, oh, you're the expert, you know, you just do whatever. I know you'll get it done and all of that. Well, you know, it's good to have people to have confidence, you know, in you like that, but you also need a checks and balances, you know, type of uh, system. You don't always want to be, you know, relied on in your eyes only, you know, looking and making decisions and, you know, in a green, you want somebody else to be, you know, your counterpart that you can bounce, you know, ideas off of that will know TRIO and, you know, our regulations and things like that. And so being on the student services side, you know, it was just like, uh, just do whatever. I know you'll get it done and you'll, you know, get it right. So then um, the leadership of the institution started restructuring and changing the dynamics of, you know, where they wanted programs to be placed. And then it starts shifting. I start getting less information they switched us over to academic services without my knowledge, you know, and it was just like reading between the lines of a board meeting um, minutes that I found out that we were no longer going to be in student services. So then it was like, okay, now I'm being faced with, you know, opposition from now my supervisor is going to be in the academic side. And now they're requiring all this, you know, paperwork, all these, you know, steps and policies that in the eight years, you know, prior, I never had to, you know, do. 
And then over this past year, so I just um, turned into my ninth year working there. And then it's just been like pure hell. So like, I just appreciate the fact that we have um, leadership at upper levels that can help and combat when, you know, our institution, for example, is trying to say, oh, you can't do this, you can't do that. And I know the regulations. Lolita, and so, I'm gonna, yeah. I'm, gonna, I'm gonna interrupt you because I, I want, uh -huh. we've been intentional in creating the, the theme. What about uh -huh. that experience surprises you as it relates to your leadership? So it's just like the opposition of, so with my leadership, it, it challenged, you know, me making decisions. So now I second guess, you know, well, can I do this? Or, you know, now I got to go back and search and find when I was confident, you know, before, because, you know, I've, you know, read regulations, you know, on and on and on. And so it's just like, now it's, it makes me question and second guess the decisions that, you know, I have to make because now I have somebody else questioning, you know, the decisions that I make. Gotcha. Thank you for that. Awesome. Andrew? So the experiences that you are having and, um, and developing and, and challenging yourselves, um, especially your EOA experience and your chapters um, and, and uh, being on this board, it does create an opportunity for you um, to leverage um, this experience. Um, I think in a lot of ways, what I've experienced through uh, my experience with the chapters, um, being on committees, um, being in EOA, is that um, I wasn't perfect going in and I wasn't perfect going out, um, but I was different. Um, the experience, I, what I get out of this, and I think you, you've all expressed that, especially because of the network and the support, is that what this experience has done is it created an incubator for me to be um, really to be better and do better um, in what I do, not only for our chapter, but then how does that change me as a thought leader? How does that change me as um, as giving me leverage in in the institutions and in the communities that I serve um, and that I'm in? So I think like a lot of you have expressed that this experience has given you an opportunity to gain confidence, um, even though that there's still doubt. I think it expanded your bubble. Um, it expanded your network. Um, even though you um, are going to continue to, to need that. But I think probably for me, most importantly, um, this experience and the leverage that it gave it, it gave me legitimacy and it gave me confidence of authority um, that I feel now more than ever um, confident to go into the university president's office and really ex I felt like I have all this all these people across the country around me when I go into a meeting or I go into business to, to um, lay the expectation of, of what our students are feeling and what our students are needing, for example. And I'll, I think I can serve um, the individuals that, I'm, that I value, the individuals that um, I'm committed to better because of this experience that I've had. Um, I, I think if I was a trio director and, and I never was involved in chapter leadership, never was involved in committee work, never was involved in, in the regional or the national level, um, there is no way I would be able to, to do and sometimes even get away with um, the things that, um, that I'm able to do. Kay, did you want to add some things to that? You know, I, I, I completely concur. <laughs> I've had folks ask me 
um, often, well, why did you remain a trio director for 20 years, right? Or why did you stay in that particular position forever? Um, and while I did not move up in my professional career for pay, I certainly moved up in my volunteer service career, um, where I can now say that I served at the apex uh, from, from an even international stance. Um, advocating for and educating around the notion of access, success, and completion for first-generation and low-income students. And when you bring that type of experience and gravitas that you develop through your volunteer work back to your campus community, it's not overlooked. And so I, my, um, it's certainly like Andrew, I walk in and I know I got a, a posse behind me um, you know, I have a what I call a cabinet of, of trio colleagues that I meet with regularly to, to even talk about things that I do now that are not trio related. So you hold on to those, that group of people, but you leverage it for yourself and for your students. Um, I'm channeling my Maureen Hoyler here, right? Um, not all of you will remain around a trio table. And that is okay because we need trio people at all levels of education throughout your institution. And I can say without a shadow of a doubt that my foundation in trio plays out in my work in the provost office absolutely every day to the extent that we've been able to add to our strategic plan, strategic uh, initiatives for first gen students, resources that are going to our trio programs that we never would have had access to. Um, building TRIO and first-gen student activities and outcomes into our university accreditation pieces. So you can leverage the work and the expertise that you've developed at many different levels to move not just your, you know, 200 students in your SSS project or the, you know, 15 of your UB students who actually matriculate to your institution, but you have, you are building the skills to move an entire institution. And what I've learned in the state of Kansas, if I can move Wichita State, I can move the rest of them too. Uh, because if we're doing something really well, other institutions wanna be able to do that really well. And so don't sleep on the fact that um, some of you are here because nobody else ran. Some of you are here <laughs> because you got the short straw and you're the, it's your turn. Just get up there and do it because nobody else wants to do it. Don't let that preclude you from understanding the fullness of what it is that you have an opportunity to learn and experience and to develop that can be leveraged both for the students that you know, love, and trust, and for your own particular career, even beyond service in TRIO. Very good. Uh, Dr. Rebecca Stewart. Um, anything that you would like to add? We're kind of closing up this piece um, uh, of, of our time. Um, anything you'd like to add? In relation, <clears throat> excuse me, in relation to the current, you said close out this piece, you mean the? Yeah, anything about your experience in regards to how this experience has maybe either developed you as a leader or you're using this as a leverage um, to maybe get other things done? Yeah, uh, I just wanna make sure I answered the right Oh, part. that's a fine. <laughs> uh, yes, I mean, I actually would, would echo what um, Ms. Kay just said. You know, I, it, it sometimes feels like we're in a bubble, you know, our own little trio bubble on campus. But when you, um, you take on a role as a, a state uh, leader or uh, go on in the region or you're doing some other type of work or, or working on an initiative that is nationally recognized and you bring that back to your campus. I mean, you, it's still your job to promote that, you know, to advocate for the work that you're doing. Um, but when, when you do that and they see it for what it is, you know, giving a presentation or report out at a, um, a VP meeting or something like that and continue to do that, um, and folks kind of stand up and take notice and you become, uh, it gives voice to your office. You know, we want to be the experts on our campus for first generation students and, um, and students that fit our populations. We want to be the experts and often we're not seen that way because someone else steps in and says, oh, we can do that. We do that. 
and uh, take it and run with it. But when you get one of these roles, you, you have that duty to take that back to your campus and let them understand, here's what I'm doing. And here's how this benefits our students here on this campus and our university as a whole. And uh, as a result, you do end up with a lot of phone calls and a lot of uh, meetings, extra meetings, uh, <laughs> you know, um, a lot of FaceTime, but FaceTime with the folks you may not have otherwise had, had time with. So I have appreciated that fact uh, in, in this journey that, um, you know, I, I get to be seen as someone who is, unfortunately the word I'm gonna use, uh, valuable in the eyes of some other <laughs> folks in, in higher education, uh, where they, they don't say, oh, you just a trio director, you just work with those kids, um, that we actually have a wealth of knowledge and experience to bring to the table that can be of assistance. You talk about strategic planning, we do that. You know, large scale budgeting, we do that. Staff development and hiring part-time, full-time, we do all of that. And on top of that, we manage our programs successfully um, and report out to a second boss out in uh, Washington, D.C. I mean, there's so many. If you can work in TRIO um, at all the different levels and then take on a leadership role within the associations that you're affiliated with, you can do anything. If you can do anything. It is 100% about how you uh, leverage that leadership and really pull out. You know, like when we talk to our students when they're developing their, their um, uh, resumes, you know, and they say, oh, well, I haven't done anything. I haven't, I mean, I just did this. You're like, well, what did you do while you were doing this? Mm -hmm. And as they start to list it, you say, okay, well, that actually is this skill set. And that actually is this skill set that's good for these things that the job is requiring. And it's the same thing with your roles here. Uh, you would do yourself a disservice if you diminish the, the good work that you're doing as a director, as a, as a coordinator, as a uh, advisor, um, and then also as a state leader, regional leader, and so forth. Uh, you do yourself a disservice if you discount the, the good work and the experience that you're getting um, here in, in, at this level of where you are in your leadership. So, yeah. Thanks, Amy. You know what? I want to piggyback on that. Part of my job now reports directly to our university president because I'm in charge of university strategic planning. The entire university strategic plan facilities master plan, diversity plan, strategic plan, budget, all of that comes through my office. Because on my resume, I said that I chaired the EOA strategic planning committee, <laughs> and I was on the COE strategic planning committee. And my boss is like, she has lots of strategic planning experience. And I competed against two PhDs, both one in STEM and one in communications, I don't have an earned doctorate yet. I'm, I'm a doctoral candidate officially. Yay, finished mm -hmm. comps. Um, because I, my, the, the committee saw strategic planning. Yeah. Because of my, my service to my regional association. So when they talked about strategic planning, absolutely we do planning in our programs, but I was able to talk about the ELA strategic plan that we just, you know, we did in 2012 or whatever. Um, got me a job. So Dr. Stewart is absolutely right. Be, be mindful that your service can lead to something and the skills that you are acquiring matter yes. and are applicable in lots of different situations. You've got you've to figure out, some of us have figured out how to leverage those and are more than happy to, to talk to folks who may um, struggle with doing that, but absolutely don't sleep on um, this isn't just stuff you do because it's passion work. It's stuff that you're doing because it advances who you are and it advances your institution in powerful uh, and important ways. And, and be proud of that um, and, and honor that. I think a lot of times people say, oh, they're just doing this as a stepping stone. This is a stepping stone. It's a stepping stone to your own personal and professional development. Um, and you should honor that and be proud of that. Um, and, and just keep moving forward um, on it. So that, this ends our journey um, this morning, um, and we definitely appreciate it uh, as well. Uh, Kay Monk Morgan and, and Dr. Rebecca Stewart, thank you very much uh, for, 
for allowing us to be a part of this um, and your and all of your board and your leadership team in in making this uh, this journey so meaningful and engaging. I really do appreciate that. Um, Rebecca, I'm not sure what your plans are next, um, but again, thank you for having us. Thank you. Thank you both for for being here for putting together this presentation and sharing your time with us, uh, getting us thinking about, you know, in the midst of all that's going on, we still have to remember what we're doing, why we're doing it, and how we can move forward after this. So um, it's very good. It's exactly what I was hoping we would be able to discuss today. So I thank you for that. And then uh, everybody else, I'm going to tell you one more thing. Let me look at my notes. Just a reminder, and then I'll cut you loose. Um, the committee list. I want to ask each of you, you're currently serving in a, a role, you're either the co-chair or chair of a committee. Please let me know if you wish to remain in those places for the next year uh, or if you'd like to do something else. I did send out a form, a Google form, and I can resend that to you. I've only received two, two responses from the entire membership on who wanted to participate uh, and as a member or serve as a committee chair. But I wanna make sure that you all have the opportunity to do that too. This year we were kind of cut short. So um, if, if you, you know, were really tied to those uh, ch charges and you say, I would like a second opportunity to really fulfill those, let's, get, let's do that. But I wanna make sure that you're in the place where you wanna be. So please let me know. And then secondly, don't forget about the national uh, graduation celebration. I am submitting those names on Friday to Maureen. So uh, right now I think I have four people from our region who have uh, volunteered and uh, I will submit those names. But if you have any others or if you yourself want to participate, please send me your information and I'll get that sent over. But, but that's it. I appreciate you all and thank you for, for being here, for participating. Thank you. Alrighty. See you all. Take care. And Hi, friends. Okay, congratulations. Uh, I know, thanks. I defend my, my proposal, June 22nd. June 22nd. Now come put that on Please my calendar. Do. Send up extra prayers that day. One Please do. Please do. Okay. Bye, friends. All right, take care, all. Bye. No. Okay.